Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Hernando Church of the Nazarene Sunday School time on this October 18th, 2020. I want to thank everyone who's here with us this morning. Appreciate your coming. My name is Hal Whittet. I'll be your teacher this morning, and I hope that you'll find our time together to be meaningful and productive. Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this Lord's Day, for this opportunity to come together, to quiet our hearts and our minds, to put aside the cares of the world, even for these few moments, and just bask in the knowledge that you are God, that you love us, you care about us, and that our lives are in your hands. We pray, Lord, as we go through this lesson this morning, that the words that I speak will be your words, that they will be meaningful to the people who are hearing. We pray that you will bless them in each of the lives of the people who hear. And we pray, Lord, that everything that's said this morning will be to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, in a nutshell, I would like to delve into the interrelatedness of the personal, spirit-filled life and the spiritual life of the church. So I'm going to be speaking about the Holy Spirit in the context of the individual and the church body. To do that, I am going to first review briefly the Church of the Nazarene's doctrine of heart holiness or sanctification. Then I want to do a brief study of the church universal and then tie the two together by using our church, the Hernando Church of the Nazarene, as an example. So here we go. As all of us gathered here together this morning should know and probably do know, the reason for the Church of the Nazarene's existence is to promote our distinctive doctrine of heart holiness, and even more importantly, to live out that doctrine, which means to intentionally conform every aspect of our lives to it, to conform or subject the details of our lives in the spiritual requirements and ramifications of that doctrine. It's a doctrine of heart holiness that also answers to the names of sanctification, Christian perfection, heart purity, perfect love, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and others. So let me review, because I've spoken about this before. You probably all have heard me. We call it our distinctive doctrine because it makes us distinct from most other churches or denominations out there. Other churches and denominations whose faith traditions teach neither that heart holiness is essential to a transformed life, nor do they teach that such a transformed life is essential to meaningful earthly existence and to eternal salvation. It separates us. To receive this grace or blessing of heart holiness, the born again or saved individual must first make the decision and then act on that decision to sincerely dedicate himself or herself entirely to the Lord. That means to consciously, by the power of the Holy Spirit, turn over his or her whole life to the Lord. We believe that when that dedication is made, that person is actually filled with the Holy Spirit. The law of God is written within him and the Holy Spirit actually resides within him or her, within that person. Now that's a decision and action that is not just for the benefit of the individual. Rather, it's, about, it's wholly about relationships. That decision ushers in a new relationship with Jesus, the head of our church, through the offices of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul famously wrote to the believers in Rome about this decision and its implementation in chapter 12 of his letter to the Romans. He wrote, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. So according to Paul, spiritual worship is vastly more than just the music we play and sing on a Sunday morning or the sermons that we hear that convict us, challenge us, and teach us. To Paul, acceptable spiritual worship is to offer our body, which is the totality of our being, as a living sacrifice to God. And that's a big deal. Now, it's obvious that such a decision, conscious action, and receiving the Holy Spirit's life within us 
is uniquely personal to each and every individual. Growth in grace that takes place after the event of total sanctification is unique and personal to each individual. The Holy Spirit transforms the lives of sanctified individuals from the inside out, one life at a time, according to in each person's choices and unique life circumstances. And that transformation, that transformation will determine where the individual will spend eternity. It is that important. So now, having acknowledged that the impact that heart holiness has on an individual is universally profound and deeply life transforming, I want to turn and explore the inextricable interconnectedness of the individual's transformed life with the life of the church. I want to explore the fact that the dogma of heart holiness that lives loudly within the individual impacts the body of Christ, the fellowship of believers. Now to do that, I've had to consult a number of authorities on the subject. I'm not a scholar, I'm not an authority, I'm just a Sunday school teacher. So to keep from sitting here and spouting opinions to you, I go to the, to the theologians, the commentators, the people who, ha who are acknowledged authorities, and get what I have to say from them, and then I convey it to you. This morning I'm draw drawing heavily on the theologies of H. Orton Wiley and his Christian theology, and H. Ray Dunning and his Grace, Grace Faith, and Holiness theology. If you want more details, I'll be happy to supply them to you. But just know that the words I'm speaking to you this morning are not my opinion. They are drawn from authorities. So, to begin, let me say that anyone who is familiar with this church, our church right here, our little outpost here on the shores of beautiful Sala Apopka Lake, is currently living through what is arguably the most dread circumstances in the life of any church. It's that circumstance that's known as the church split. It is, as you can imagine, a difficult time in the church. But as I go forward here, I want to make the argument that this split actually affords the church a rich opportunity to further the ministry to which we're called. For purposes of our discussion here, the reasons for the split don't need to be acknowledged or named because my intent is not to look back at those events. Rather, my intent is to take a look at where we go from here if and as we look to the future through the, the lens of this relationship with Jesus that we know as heart holiness and the impact that that personal relationship has on the church body. But first, I need to lay some groundwork about the church. I need to go back and review some history of the church universal. Now, the church universal means the church throughout the world. It doesn't mean this church here in Hernando or your church wherever you may be, be listening or watching. It's the church universal. A little history. In the early documents of the church, the Christian church, it's called the Catholic Church with a small c. Catholic meaning universal. But when the, East, when the Eastern Church and the Western Church split, the Western Church, which was based in Rome, took the name of Catholic because they felt that the Universal Church was only the church that looked to, uh, to Rome as its authority, as its head. So from the Roman perspective, the, the Catholic Church was the Universal Church that looked to Rome. The Eastern Church decided not to use the word Catholic and they took on the name Orthodox. So now we have the, the Eastern Orthodox Church and we have the Roman Catholic Church. But when you see in the writings of the early fathers the word Catholic with a small, a small c, it means universal. So that's what the church universal is. First of all, the church is not what burns when you strike a match. The church is the people under the authority of the Spirit of God or as John Calvin put it, the Spirit of Christ. As we see clearly going all the way back to the Israelites in the Old Testament after God delivered them out of Egypt. In Acts chapter 7 verse 38, Paul referred to that congregation in the desert as the church in the wilderness. Talking about the Israelites at the foot of Mount Sinai, the church in the wilderness. Well, why did he call it that congregation a church? The Hebrew word that is used in the context of what we call church means to call together. It signifies an assembly of people 
or a congregating that is convened for any purpose, but especially for religious purposes. And the people of Israel at that point were nothing if not congregated together. The Church of the Wilderness was first formed at the time of the covenant event at Mount Sinai when God gave Moses the law and all the people agreed to abide by that law. Effectively, the covenant, which was a spiritual covenant, was solemnified and the congregation of people became a church that was united by blood. They were united by a common ancestry. But even, the old, even though the Old Testament church was united by blood, it was nonetheless a community of the spirit as the spirits of the people covenanted with God, who, as we know from the scriptures, is spirit. So the church in the wilderness was a supernatural body, not just a collection of people. And it was that supernatural body of the Old Testament Israelites that directly contributed to the New Testament Christian church. It directly contributed to the Christian church in a couple of ways. First, it cultivated the religion. It nurtured the religion and matured the people's knowledge of God and their worship of the one true God. It grew up during the time that they were under the authority of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. It was that religion, that knowledge and worship of the one true God that would eventually issue in the New Testament church under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. Now, that church of the Israelites existed until the advent of Jesus. So the second way the Old Testament church contributed to the Christian church is that it was the community from which Jesus came into the world. The Apostle Paul expounded on that contribution by the Israelites in Romans chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, where he wrote that the human ancestry of Jesus is from the Israelites. There's no doubt about it. So the church in the wilderness grew and matured the religion and then ultimately contributed Jesus to the world. So after Jesus was born, but before he began his ministry, there was a midway period between the church in the wilderness and the Christian church. First, there was the group of disciples that were drawn to John the Baptist, who was the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way for Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist was still living under the Mosaic covenant of the law, but he closed out that covenant, which we can see when he said of Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease, which we find in the, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 30. The second stage of that midway period that prepared the Christian church took place after John the Baptist when Jesus gathered around him a de dedicated band of believers. Jesus and his followers formed a community that was midway between those whose religion was faithful to Moses and the law on the one hand and Pentecost on the other. John said, I will baptize you with water unto repentance. But then he gave way to Jesus by saying, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The scripture that we find in Matthew chapter three, verse 11. So the first stage in this midway community of faith was John the Baptist and his followers. The second stage was the group of people who gathered around Jesus, either as his disciples or otherwise became his devoted followers. In this second stage, there were 12 apostles, the 70 who were sent out to preach the word, and some 500 others who all believed that Jesus was the Christ. And they coalesced as a community because of their love for Jesus and because of their faith in the truth that he was teaching. And that's an important statement because it was their love for Jesus and their faith that he was the Messiah. It was their belief in that their love for Jesus and their faith that he was the Messiah that made them worthy to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So at Pentecost, they became the true core of the church, which was in fact created by the Holy Spirit. It was this newly instituted body of believers that Jesus gave the name, my church. When in Matthew chapter six, verse 10, it's recorded, he said to Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Then in Jesus' high priestly prayer, which we find recorded in John chapter 13, 
He formally dedicated his church to God, and he prayed for unity among the people and unity of the people with the Holy Trinity. And we find those dedications in uh, John chapter 17, verses 11, verses 21 and 22, if you'd like to look it up. But when he prayed that prayer about the church and their unity, he spoke of it as a church that was still in the future. It had not yet been fully instituted. Jesus laid the foundation for the church and he left valuable instructions, but it couldn't be fully instituted until the day of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit. So it's well acknowledged that Pentecost was the birthday of the Christian church. The disciples were all assembled of one accord in Jerusalem when without warning the Holy Spirit came on all of them in power and the followers of Christ in that midway community became a new, and I quote, holy temple in the Lord, end quote, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians. They became a new holy temple in the Lord. Under the Old Covenant, Pentecost celebrated the giving of the law to Moses at Mount Sinai, but now it represents the fullness of the new covenant in which the Holy Spirit was written, has written the law of God on the hearts of men and women who are believers. The new covenant. So these scriptures and many others make it clear that the church has been brought into existence as a purely spiritual entity. Also, in addition to the, the scriptures, there's another interesting evidence that the church is a spiritual entity, which we find in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed concludes with this. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Well, notice that that statement of belief in the universal church and the communion of saints is bracketed by belief in the totally spiritual verities of the Holy Spirit on the one hand, and on the other hand, the forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and everlasting life. All those beliefs are spiritual beliefs. They take place in the spiritual realm, not in the natural world. So if the church were not a spiritual entity, it would not have been included in that statement of belief. It would have been logically excluded from that paragraph. It wouldn't have fit. So we can take from that that even the early church, the, uh, the, the fathers of the belief, understood the church to be a spiritual entity. So now hopefully you're beginning to see that my intent is to prove the church is more than just a congregation of people, that it is first and foremost a spiritual holy temple, to use Paul's words to the Ephesians. So let me take this spiritual aspect of the church a step further. H. Orton Wiley, one of the preeminent theologians in the church of the Nazarene, makes this powerful statement about the role of the Holy Spirit in the church. First I'll read it, then I'll come back. He wrote, the church is the creation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit administering the life of the church is said to make us members of his spiritual body and that ministering in his own proper personality as the third person of the Trinity, he is said to dwell in the holy temple thus constructed. The church therefore is not merely an independent creation of the Spirit, but an enlargement of the incarnate life of Christ. That's incredibly powerful. Let's just go back. He acknowledges that the church is the creation of the Holy Spirit. It's a spiritual entity. And he says the Holy Spirit, administering the life in the church, church, is said to make us members of his spiritual body. So as we, when we join the church, join in the church, Spiritually, we become a member of the Holy Spirit himself. And that ministering in his own proper personality or his own personhood as the third person of the Trinity, he said to dwell in the holy temple that he constructs. So his holy temple is a spiritual temple that he has constructed and we are allowed to live in that temple as we are spiritually right before him, which I'll get more to in a minute. So the church, therefore, he says, is not an independent creation of the Spirit, but it's an enlargement 
of the incarnate life of Christ. So it says as we are drawn into this holy temple of Christ, which is a spiritual temple, we become physically, our physical bodies, an enlargement of Christ's physical body when he was here on earth. That's powerful, that we become actually the, the, the physical bodies of Jesus when we are included in the holy temple of the Holy Spirit. Think about that for a little bit. That's pretty powerful. So why am I spending so much time to make the case that the Christian church is spiritual, that it was instituted by God, was proclaimed and dedicated by Jesus, and was instituted by what we call the plenary shedding abroad of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost? Why am I spending so much time? Because I think that it's important that we hold in our minds a correct understanding of what the church truly is. Now, I'm going to try something here. I don't have the ability to inspire within any of you any particular emotion. But that said, I would encourage each of you to first think about the church. And when you think about the church, ordained by God, instituted through the Holy Spirit, allow yourselves to pause, reflect on that spiritual nature of the church, and experience a sense of awe, A-W-E. If we give thought to it, the church, ordained by God, proclaimed and dedicated by Jesus, then instituted through the Holy Spirit as a spiritual holy temple, as an enlargement of the incarnate life of Christ, that is truly awesome when we contemplate that, when we meditate on it. But I want to draw a little more fine line on that. I like definitions. So what is the definition of awe, A-W-E? One dic dictionary has it, an emotion of mingled reverence, dread, and wonder that is inspired by something that is majestic or sublime. And sublime is defined as nobility, grandeur, of high spiritual, moral, or intellectual worth. If we apply those elements of awesome to the church, I think it's fair to say that we should hold the church in an admixture of reverence, fear of God, wonder, nobility, grandeur, something of inestimable spiritual, moral, and intellectual worth, something that's truly awesome. We should not hold light thoughts of the church. There's deep meaning when we talk about the church. So let me summarize. First, I've tried to make the case that God calls us individually to seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to live out our earthly lives in the blessing of and under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And second, I've tried to present the church as a spiritual holy temple in which the Spirit-filled people congregate under, if I may, the spreading wings of the Holy Spirit for spiritual purposes. A spiritual temple, not a church building, but a temple that is truly awe-inspiring and a creation of God. It's intended to glorify God and to impart eternal benefit to each of us as we are sanctified holy. And that eternal benefit that the spiritual church is intended to impart to each of us is not just a benefit uh, for those of us who are current members of local churches. Jesus ordained the church, but what did he tell us is the mission of the church? Well, just as the church in the wilderness was called into being to represent the one true God to the nations, we find the continuation of that charge in the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, what we know as the Great Commission. And it reads like this. Jesus said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. End quote. So the church wasn't ordained to be a repository of perfect people. Its primary purpose is to be active and engaged with the world for positive spiritual purposes. In my reading, I discovered a statement by a theologian that speaks to the apostolic character of the church. That is, the church's charge to act 
as Christ's apostles here on the earth to whom the the Great Commission was given. His subject was the church's role as a bridge between God and the lost. He wrote this, the witnessing and ministering church can only exist as it is intensely driven by the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. The witnessing and ministering church, the church that witnesses and ministers, can only exist that is, as it is intensely driven by the Holy Spirit. Pretty powerful stuff. And then he really previews the ultimate point that I want to make this morning about the Hernando Church. He wrote this, the church can only give in the measure that she herself receives. She cannot be the bridge between the covenant establishing God and his world unless she herself has a firm footing on that first shore. Her first relationship is to her Lord, and this relationship is the inspirational source and the content as well as the standard for her directedness to the world. There's a lot there. That language can be a little opaque, so let me paraphrase it for you. He's saying that the church cannot give more to the world than what she receives from God. The church cannot be the bridge between God and the world unless the church, in this context, the church can be read as the people. So to go back, the church cannot be the bridge between God and the world unless the church is firmly grounded in the Lord. He's saying that before we can go out as missionaries into the world and form relationships with the world, we first have to have a firm relationship with the Lord because it is our relationship with the Lord that is the source of our missional inspiration. That is purely spiritual. It is through our relationship with the Lord that we receive the message that we have to convey to the world. Bottom line here, we have to be first and foremost firmly grounded in our relationship with God if we are to hope to have any impact on the world. So let me bring this down to the specific. What does all of this mean for our church here in Hernando? As a result of the church split, structures have been crumbled, some sacred cows have been gored, and people have been lost, but now it's time to rebuild. We have effectively bare land on which to rebuild the church. And what a phenomenal opportunity this point of rebuilding presents us. We can make this church into anything that we want to. You believe that? Sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? So what do we do with this opportunity? Well, until now I've drawn from recognized authorities, but now I'm offering my opinion for your consideration. I hope you find it worthwhile. I see this rending of the church as an opportunity, not as a catastrophe. If we choose to adopt a particular mind split, <laughs> mindset, excuse me, if we choose to adopt a particular mindset, this split can serve as a catalyst for those of us who remain to regroup, to rethink our mission, and to recommit to living out our distinctive doctrine, not just individually, but as a church body. I think that I think that now is the time for deep introspection as individuals, but even more as a church body. Deep introspection and a sincere recommitment. And here's where I want to tie it all together. The church is the holy temple of Christ. It is the holy temple where the Holy Spirit of God perpetually resides. I think it's a bit presumptuous, trying to be a little snarky here, when we sing this song, which is a beautiful song, Holy Spirit, thou art welcome in this place. Ought to be the Holy Spirit who's sing, singing, hey, you guys, you're welcome in this place. This is my place. Welcome. But anyway, because the Holy Temple is spirit, the only means by which we can fully participate in the mission of that Holy Temple is if we individually enter, if we individually enter in filled with that same Holy Spirit. That's where our doctrine of heart holiness comes in. The doctrine that we, by our own choice and actions, are able to actually be filled with that very same Holy Spirit who is the Spirit of God's holy temple. When we enter into that temple and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, 
Our spirit can then seamlessly mesh and intermingle with the Holy Spirit of the temple because that Holy Spirit of the temple is the same Holy Spirit that fills us. That's how true communion is created. We are able to deeply, deeply, meaningfully commune with both the love and the omnipotent power of the spirit who participated in the creation of the universe. And just as that spirit created the universe, he will also create our little church as we are fully consecrated to him in our spirits and as our spirits meet and mesh with his spirit. Our full consecration affords the Holy Spirit the opportunity to communicate to us what he wants us to do in order to carry out our function as the apostles of Christ here on earth, a function for which he and he alone will empower us. So each individually, individual is vitally important and necessary in the church. For this local church to be all that Jesus intends it to be, we, each and every one of us, need to be certain that we are fully committed to the Lord and that the Spirit of the Lord lives in us. Our doctrine of heart holiness is meaningful and critical to the life and ministry of our church. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, we read, For the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro over all the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully devoted to him. Those whose hearts are fully devoted to him sounds like nothing other than people who are saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, and are engaged in meaningful ministry. God bless you all this morning. Thank you for listening.